right, I'll tell you, that was good. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for these wonderful hymns uh, that we sang here this evening, Lord. What a, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Thank you so much, Lord, for loving me and forgiving me of all my sin and iniquity and every evil thing I ever thought or done. Thank you for the cleansing with thy precious blood. Thank you for the white robes of righteousness, Lord God. Thank you of the hope of heaven, but the hope that every day I live with the fact that it may be the day that you say, come up hither and you call your waiting bride home. We pray, Father, like John the Apostle, even so come, Lord Jesus. May it not be too long off in the future, and may we be found faithful when you do return. Father, be with the children in the back. Speak to their hearts and work mightily through the ministry there. Speak through me here as we take a look at your word. And Father, just draw souls ever closer to yourself. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right. So we're in Romans chapter 4. And tonight I decided to ditch the outline, because sometimes the outline gets in the way. And so we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 4 and try to learn something, amen? It was funny because I was talking to uh, me and Charlotte's dad, have a lot of good conversations about pastoring and preaching and messages and stuff, and, and we both agreed that, you know, sometimes the outline just gets in the way, and you just need to just preach the straight word of God. And so I was going through this, and I'm like, this is such a great chapter, I don't want to mess it up by an outline getting in the way. So I didn't outline it, we're just going to look at it, amen? Now, in, in chapter 3, we learn from the book of Romans that salvation is free. For us, it costs nothing. It costs Jesus everything, amen? It costs God the Father a lot, everything. But for us, it's absolutely free. He says in chapter 3 of verse 26, he says, To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified. He is declared righteous by faith without the deeds of the law, the works of the law. Salvation is free. Then, in chapter 4, we see that salvation is by faith. It is by faith. It's in believe in faith. It's, it's the same word. It's, uh, it's basically talking about the same thing. And so, salvation is by faith. Now, in the first three verses there, of chapter 4, the Word of God starts off by telling us, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What has he found? What did Abraham find out? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. In other words, if Abraham was declared righteous by works, he might be able to glory in the presence of other men and say, listen, I left the earth, the Chaldees, I loaded up and I moved into Canaan and I did all this by faith and look at you, you're disobedient. You don't obey God the way I obey God. And so compared to other men, he might have room to glory, but not before God. Nobody can ever... What is that? Is that me? I thought I left this in my coat pocket. Uh, he should know better than be calling me now. I just need that there. Tom, Tom Beam with the doll. He should know I'm in service right now. All right, now I got to get my thoughts back on. He can't go. He cannot glory before God. Amen. Because nobody can. In fact. Think about it. Think about, would you be willing to take the best five minutes of your life, of all, of all the years that you live, the best five minutes of your life 
and be willing to put that on the scale of God's justice? None of us would. Amen? We, we know we would still come short. Amen? Amen? So he wouldn't glory before God. Nobody can glory before God that their works were so good that they were able to get to heaven because they just lived up, lived up to the law of God all the time. Nobody can do it. And so he tells us there in verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? What do the Scriptures say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed God. He was made righteous not because of what he did. He was, he was counted righteous because of what he believed. He believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, uh, verses 16 through, through, through uh, 21 define for us what he, what he believed. What was it that he believed? Well, he believed what God told him. Uh, we're going to get to that. I was going to you know, just cut to that and look at that, but I want to take this chapter 4 as it's laid out before us but I do want us to go back to Genesis 15 real quick to see what it was that Abraham believed. Because here, Paul is quoting uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse number 6. But we want to look at Genesis, uh, Genesis 15. We want to look at those first, first six verses real quick. Genesis chapter 15. And there, uh, the Word of God tells us. Genesis 15, the Word of God tells us, at verse number 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So it's going to be not somebody, not one of your servants or someone in your home, it is going to be someone that you bring into this world. You and Sarah both. Now, they, the whole thing with Ishmael was Abraham and Sarah acting in the flesh trying to help God along instead of just trusting and believing God. All right, so anyway, he, he tells him in verse number 5, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. There's your seed, Abraham. That's how many is going to come from you, if you can count them. Now notice verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So what did he believe? He believed that he was going to have seeds if he could count the stars of the heaven. That's how many there would be. He believed what God promised him would come to pass. Now it's important because a lot of people, even amongst our Baptist circles, they, they say, well, Abraham believed the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. Abraham didn't even know the gospel. He didn't know the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, they didn't understand most of that. We're going to look at that as we look at uh, Luke chapter 24 on Sunday nights. We're going to get into that a little, a little deeper. Yeah, it was there in the Old Testament and there was types of it and the, and the prophets talked about it. But the way that they were understanding things is that there was two messiahs. There was a, a suffering messiah and there was a political messiah. Even today in Israel, they still are looking for two messiahs. A suffering messiah and a political messiah. A, a, uh, a Ben David and a Ben Joseph. And that's what those Jews call them. That's not biblical, but that's what, what they believe, what they're looking for. Uh, so the Jews didn't totally understand everything, and for sure Abraham didn't understand about death, burial, and resurrection. So what did he believe in order to be declared righteous before God? He believed that what God told him was true. 
and would come to pass. That's what he believed. Now we today, we believe God by believing that Jesus Christ was enough to satisfy the wrath of God. We believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection. And because we believe that, God declares us righteous. So you've got to pay attention to the dispensation and individuals in and how much information they have. Amen? How much information they have. There is no way. I mean, I, I challenge you. I challenge anybody. You show me where he believed in the death, burial, and resurrection. You're just not going to find it. Amen? You're not going to find it there. But what did he believe? He believed that what God told him would come to pass. It would happen. Amen? So, that's why he was made righteous. He, his, his, his belief, he believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Counted, it was put to his account. All right, back in Romans chapter 4, now verse number 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that is justified, uh, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you see that? What's counted for righteousness? His faith. Why? Because he believed the right thing. He believed the gospel message. So now the argument that Paul is going to begin to make is that, is that works is all of debt. You're, you're, you're a debtor. If you're trusted in works, it's not grace, it's a debt. You're trying to pay off a debt. So he says in verse 4 again, he says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. I want you to think about this uh, uh, concerning like your employer. Uh, every week when I work at Walmart, uh, before I went full time here, when I'm working at Walmart, uh, every, well, every other week I guess it was, they gave me a check, right? That check was my paycheck. That wasn't grace from Walmart. That was Walmart paying off a debt. They owed me that money because we were in an agreement that I would work for X amount of dollars and they would pay me. So when payday came, that was a debt. They were paying a debt. Now at Christmas time, they would give you a $50 check for Christmas. Okay? I mean, people would complain about that. I one time I walked in the office and this lady's complaining, well, Walmart, you give me $50 and I can't believe that. And I said, well, first of all, can you imagine $50 per every employee that Walmart has? That's a lot of money they're giving away. And they're giving that to you. You're not working for that. You're not earning that. They're giving this to you. So how can you complain? They don't have to give you anything, right? They don't have to give you anything. And so, so what? It's $50. It's $50 you didn't have. And so it is, it's grace. So my regular paycheck is work and Walmart is paying off a debt because I work for that money. But that Christmas bonus, that was grace. Because they were giving me something that I didn't necessarily deserve. And they didn't necessarily have to give. Amen? So there's a difference between works and grace. And, and work, you're, you're paying off a debt. You know, uh, I use this illustration all the time. If I tell George, uh, George, go wash my car and I'll give you my Bible. Right? Well, that's not a gift because it's based on him doing the job, him washing my car. So it's works. He's working for my Bible. And with salvation, there is no work attached to it at all. It is a gift. If it's not a gift, if you've got to do something to get it, then it's not a gift no longer. But the Bible repeatedly calls salvation a gift from God. And so it's a gift that is all you can do is receive it or reject it. Say, no, I don't want that. Or yes, and receive it and take it. And it is a gift. And so that's what salvation is. So, he says, now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. Believeth on him. That's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's encompassing the death, the burial, the resurrection, and all that he did. But believeth on him that justifies, declares righteous. Now, who does he declare righteous? Who does he justify? The ungodly. See, there ain't nobody that got saved because they were a pretty good person. 
Well, look at me. I'm a pretty good guy, so why wouldn't God save me? Come on now. You know, and some people, you really think that perhaps they believe that. Amen? But the Bible tells us he justifies the ungodly. And that's what I was. When I got saved, I was ungodly in every way possible. My thoughts, my deeds, my words. I was just an ungodly individual. And he justified me. He declared me righteous. Why? Because of what Jesus did and my faith in that. I believed in what Jesus did. Amen? And I asked him, based upon what you did, Lord, please forgive me. And he did. Amen? Forgave me all my sin. Past, present, and future. He forgave it all. All right? So, verse 5 again. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what's counted for righteousness? My faith. Not what I do, but what I believe. What I believe. Amen? Because you can do a lot of things and it not be good enough. Right? You can be at church all the time, but have no faith. You're going to die and go to hell. Even if you're in a church that's believing the truth. And you just don't believe it. I've, I've shared this story with you before about a college professor and... Uh, around the Easter time, this college professor, and I wish I could remember the college, and I can't, and he got up and he preached this absolutely tremendous message on the resurrection. And he, people applauded him and everything. And he went back to his seat and he sat down, and his colleague there, he said, hey, I, I thought you didn't believe in the resurrection. And he said, oh, I don't, but they do. You see that? He didn't believe. But he was preaching it as if he did because he knew the people listening to him would believe it and would like what he was saying. So here's a person that's in a religious establishment that's holding a, a degree and a professor and he doesn't even believe what he's teaching. Doesn't even believe. You know what's going to happen? He's going to die and he's going to go to hell. Because, not because he didn't do anything good. Yeah, it was good that he preached a, a good, solid message on the resurrection. But he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it, so he doesn't make it. And this pretty much is the world religions in a nutshell. They don't believe in Jesus. It's not a matter of how much good they do or don't do. It's what do they believe, and they don't believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people that don't believe in the Lord that are basically, in our eyes, morally good people. Now, the Bible tells us there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous. There's none that seeketh after God. But in our eyes, we'll see people that, we, that appear to be good people, but the problem is they don't believe. They're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. That breaks my heart. I think about a friend of mine down in Florida who had the biggest heart of anybody i ever known. And uh, he looked meaner than a junkyard dog, but he wasn't. I mean, he was a biker. That was his deal. He loved riding his Harley and going to Daytona for bike week. And this guy would do anything for anybody. I, I, I witnessed, I seen it. But he didn't believe in the gospel. He didn't believe in the Bible. And so all this good stuff he did was going to account for nothing. Now in his mind, he thought, you know, he kind of believed in the, the whole Buddhist stuff. And when we met, I got to, when we met, we first were on the job site and, and uh, we were hanging drywall together and we were on lunch break and and he said, so, so great, man, tell me, what kind of preacher are you? And I thought I would kid around, and I've done this with a lot of people. I said, well, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, you know, a Buddhist preacher. And he said, no way, man, me too. <laughs> and I, so then I had to apologize and say, no, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a Buddhist preacher. Mm. Yeah, I got that doctor's attention, didn't I? told that George's doctor, when they were loading him in a helicopter, yeah, he said something, he said, this is my pastor. He said, oh, what kind of pastor? I said, Buddhist. And <laughs> his look was funny. I said, no, no, I'm a Baptist. But, uh, but it's kind of funny just getting, uh, getting, you know, shaking him up a little. I, I, I like when I get around like these fundamental guys, like these really strong fundamental guys, you know, and they're like, so where'd you go to Bible college? And sometimes I'll say Harvard Divinity. It's like a very liberal school. And, uh, and the looks that I get, Harvard Divinity. I said, no, I was kidding, Liberty. No. And that gets even worse looks. 
But, uh, but I said, no, no, I didn't go to those schools. I went to BBC East. And now BBC East, you get dirty looks. If people in Baptist Bible College East, like, uh, they're a little, little on the liberal side, aren't they? Well, it depends on how you define liberal. They're a lot looser than we are, I can guarantee you that. But they still believe in the core doctrines. I don't necessarily would recommend anybody go there anymore, but uh, everything has, seems to go by the wayside. As time goes by, everything does. Yeah, he went to the one in Missouri, our sister school, because we, we were started out of that to try to reach people in the Northeast that churches would be started from BBC East. So all of our teachers and, and the, the school, the administrators of the school, they all were from, B, from Springfield, Baptist Bible College Springfield, which is also where Jerry Falwell graduated from. Yeah. But uh, all that has nothing to do with this message. So let's get back, <laughs> let's get back on track here. All right, so in verse number four, verse number five, he the, he justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now he's going to bring David in as an example. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now the blessedness, that word blessed, it means happy. The happiness, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth. When it says that God imputeth, it means that God put this to your account. You didn't have this, and now God put it to your account. This was a, a legal uh, uh, term in the day in which Paul wrote this, and financial term, and it was talking about something being accredited to your account. Amen? So now, for sake of illustration, uh, say Jace runs into some guy at uh, the college. He's a multimillionaire. He really likes Jace, and he likes him so much. He goes to finds out what bank Jake Jace uses, and he goes there, and he puts in a hundred thousand dollars, deposits it straight into his account. So now Charla his wants to get some school uh, yeah school clothes for the kids and whatnot. So she checks the bank account, see what what she got that she can use, and $100,000. And so right away, Jace, where'd this come from? He doesn't know. $100,000. And the bank says, well, so-and-so came and accredited this to your account. So now they have this $100,000 that they can use, right? And that's what God has done with his righteousness. He's accredited his righteousness to our account. Now, Think about it. Every time Jace would see this guy on campus, first of all, his first inclination would be to thank him, right? He gave you $100,000. So your first inclination is to thank him. Your second inclination is to never forget it. He'll never forget that that guy gave him $100,000. And that guy will just always have a special place in his heart because of that generous gift. Now, this is how it should be with us in salvation. Because God has accredited to us far more than any monetary value, amen, far more. He has taken his righteousness and he has put it to our account, given it to us, thus given us access to heaven. So that should cause us, number one, to want to thank God. And number two, to always look at God with high esteem in our heart, right? And yet so many times when something bad happens in people's life, they forget what God did. God gave you a home in heaven. How can you be bagging on God? Amen? And so we should have this appreciative heart thinking of what God has done. So David is talking about the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Saying, Now, he's quoting Psalm uh, 30. 30 2 verses 1 and 2 is the verses that he's quoting here. And he said, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now, he, David says covered because he's, he's quoting from what? The, the dispensation of law, the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, the bulls and goats did what? It, it covered your sin. That's all it could do. But under Christ, the blood of Christ removes it. It completely takes it away. It's 
gone forever. Gone, gone, gone. My sins are all gone. We have it in our hymnal, right? It's gone. Completely gone. So that's why he's quoting it. That's why he says covered. Because you don't see that term really used often in the New Testament at all. Because our sins have been removed. They've been taken away. They've been uh, separated from us. So now he's saying, blessed are they, happy are they, whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now most people can quote this verse and they really don't realize what that verse means. Blessed, look at that again in verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What would we say about imputation? Putting it to your account. He is not going to put sin to your account. Blessed. Yeah, you should be happy because you sin all the time. But God's not going to put that to your account. Why? Because Jesus already paid for it on the cross. Amen? That's why you're forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. But sin does have an effect on a believer's life and the fact of his walk with God. There's friction there, right? It's just like, I know this might be hard for you to believe, but Pamela can be stubborn sometimes. <laughs> I can. Uh, I'm just teasing. It's my, my, most of the time I'm the problem. But, uh, but we could have a disagreement, right? We, we can have a, a, a rift between us. Now guess what? We don't, all, we don't just become unmarried. I'm no longer married to you. You aggravate me. I'm no longer married. No, that, you don't become unmarried because you have a problem, a disagreement, or a rift. You're still married. But there's something that's going on that has to be dealt with, right? So say I did something to get her aggravated. I know it's hard for you to believe, but, you know, say I just didn't, I just didn't do something I should have did, you know. But I say, Pamela, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you in the way that I did, right? And so now... You, get, you make up, right? Everything's good. We won't get into detail. We'll just leave it at that. Everything, everything is good, right? It's the same way with, with sin. That our, our sin that we commit right now, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't be put on our account and have to be paid for. It was already paid for by Jesus. But what it does is it, is it causes this friction in my walk and my relationship with God. But the very moment I say, God, I'm sorry. You know, I was really being dumb about that. I was being a bonehead. And the moment I say, I'm sorry. And then what happens? It's all, it's all new again. Amen? It's all new again. God put, brings me up in his arms and he gives me a hug. Now we say, yeah, well, sometimes I confess and I still feel guilty. And I go, that's the devil working on you. Amen? Because he doesn't want you to experience that that fellowship being renewed and restored. He don't want you to feel that excitement of the walk with God. He wants you to think that God hates you, God don't like you, God is extremely uh, uh, upset, and he can't wait to get even with you for what you did. And that God just wants to cast you off. That's what the devil wants you to believe. And so that's why sometimes you'll do something and you confess it, and then you still feel guilty afterwards. And that's all it is. It's just a spiritual conflict in the mind. But as far as sin in general goes, everything has been paid for. It has been dealt with at the cross. Jesus took every sin, past, present, and future. So even, you know, doubt, you know, we'll all do something when we leave here. You know, we'll all say something or whatever, do something we shouldn't have done. But that didn't surprise God because he knows everything. And Jesus paid for it back here on the cross. He doesn't keep on praying for it. See, this is the, f the fallacy with, with Catholicism. It tries to mix works with grace. And they're constantly offering Jesus up as a sacrifice. No, he was sacrificed once for all. Amen? And so here we have this peace with God because of his sacrifice. So... Paul, or excuse me, David, even under the Old Testament economy, David understands this blessedness. He says, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not, will not impute sin. He will not put it to their account. 
Now, uh, I'll tell you what, we're, because we're already at 5 of 8, I want to stop here. But he's going to go back to using uh, Abraham as an example again. And he's going to say, cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now, the argument of the day was that a person, uh, sometimes circumcision and uncircumcision just simply is referring to a Jew versus a Gentile. But in this case, it's talking about what was the, the Jew's hope. His hope was in his circumcision. Amen? In fact, in Acts 15, and we'll look at Acts 15 next week, where, where they said you could not be saved unless you were circumcised. And so Paul has to deal with this error. What do you mean you can't be saved unless you're circumcised? And the Pharisees took it one step further. They said not only do you have to be uh, 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 circumcised, you have to keep the law. And you've got to teach these Gentiles to do so. And Paul says, no, no, that's not true. That's not the gospel, amen? And so that was that argument back then. But you know what? The argument is still going on today, but shaded a little different. People will say, well, you can't be saved unless you've been baptized. You can't be saved unless you're a faithful church member. You can't be saved unless you turn away, turn away from all your sin. And I've heard a lot of uh, evangelists and even guys in our circle and read tracts by people, and we might even have some tracts out there that say, if you believe and turn from all your sin. How much of a misnomer is that? Because there ain't nobody that turns from all their sin. Amen? That means you're absolutely perfect. And how much sin do you have to turn from that's enough to be saved? You see what I'm saying? And so... And that phrase, turn from all your sin to be saved, is nowhere in the Bible. It's not in there, amen? You will not find it. You will find the definition of the word repent, twisted, and forced in there, but you will not find that phrase. And so anyway, he's going to go on to explain that you're saying you have to be circumcised to be saved, but Abraham, who is your hero of the faith, the father of the faith, Abraham when he was saved, when it was accounted to him for righteousness, was not circumcised yet. So if you have to be circumcised to be saved, then Abraham must not have been saved. That's Paul's reasoning. But he's, but he's making an argument that circumcision has nothing to do with it. It is purely, simply what you believe. What do you trust in? Where's your faith lie? That's what's important. Amen? And so we'll look at that as it unfolds. So we'll pick up in verse 9 next week as that unfolds. And we'll jump back at Acts 15 and look at that real quick. Any thoughts or questions? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Word of God. And Lord, I just pray you give understanding to the hearts of the hearers. You would give me an ability to, to speak your Word, Father to speak it clearly and accurately, especially in these matters of salvation. And Father, I believe with all my heart that the waters have been muddied so much about salvation that, uh, that people just don't really know what the true gospel is anymore. They want to add works to it. Or they want to simplify it to the point where they think, just say this prayer and you're in. When it simply is all it is, is understanding who you are and what you have done, death, burial, and resurrection, and putting all our faith and trust in that. Understanding in my heart, I need a, sin. I need a Savior because I am a sinner. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen.